My name is Tom Donovan and I'm the Marketplace Minister. The Marketplace Minister is a place where we can preach and teach the Word of God without the pulpit. A lot of people have been asking me, what is the Marketplace Minister? The Marketplace Ministry was derived out of a series of events as where I was teaching my clients the Word of God while they were hiring me. And I was explaining to them why I did the job that I do, why I gave them the customer service that I gave them, why my product was so affordable yet very high end. So I believe that the Word of God is to go forth in every area of our lives. We need to be intentional about what we say and what we speak about our faith. With that being said, the Marketplace Minister is a platform that will allow us to speak about Jesus Christ, specifically about salvation, about sinners being saved and saints being encouraged. That's what the Marketplace Minister is. Tom Donovan is a Christian businessman who operates Him First Media Group. Him First Media Group is a full-service Christian business development firm. We focus on digital media services for ministries, churches, and Christian business owners alike. We believe that we should be intentional about our faith. And this is where Marketplace Minister was birthed. We believe that we should be intentional wherever we are, whether we're in our homes, with our families, at work, running our business, speaking with a client, we should always be sharing the love of Jesus Christ with our neighbors. I believe that the Lord will use this platform just like he used his word in Isaiah 55 11, which states that the word of God will never return void. It will always accomplish that for which it was sent forth for. So I believe that it will never return empty. God will use every platform. Whether or not we believe that is irrelevant to what God's Word can do. Many people know a little bit about my past. I have a colorful past and it's afforded me the opportunity to preach and teach the gospel almost full time. Yes, I run a business, but my desire is to be into, in full time ministry, but I'm not so sure that God's called me to be before the four walls of a church. I believe he's called me to be in the street as an evangelist. But that doesn't mean that I shouldn't be preaching and teaching the gospel. We are all called to preach the gospel. Most of the time, we don't know what to say or how to say it. Part of my aim here at Marketplace Minister would be to teach how to have those open doors, how to be intentional about your faith, how to make sure that the other person understands that you're a Christian who loves God, who's saved by His grace and not by the things that we do trying to get into heaven. It's not about religion. It's about a relationship with Jesus Christ. And we're saved because of what Jesus has done for us. We're not saved because what we do for God, but rather it's what God has done for us that saves us. And now our lives should be a living testimony of how He saved us and how grateful we are and what we share with our neighbors. Ever since I was nine years old, I always knew that I had a call in my life. I knew that Jesus Christ was calling me out and separating me from everyone else. I had this vision that around the age of 25, I would be dead. And it happened that way. Most of my life was riddled with drugs and alcohol, street crime, sex, things that are unspeakable today in my life, things that I don't even imagine doing. However, these things happened when I was younger and I always knew that I wasn't gonna be living like that forever and I thought I would die at an early age. My testimony speaks for itself. I was pistol whipped to death and I was dead at the age of 23. Jesus brought me back to life and I'll get into that later on, but I only say that to share that my life has been dedicated to serving Jesus and I never knew how that would happen. I've always been in business since I was a young teenager. And I didn't know how I would make the transition of being in business and helping other people with the gospel. God, as he saw forth, gave me a platform called Marketplace Minister to preach and teach the gospel in a very plain way that would show us how to be intentional about our faith, what it looks like to be a Christian, what it means to share our faith with other people, what we believe, why we believe what we believe, and how we should go about letting others know about what we believe. I just want to give you an example. Today, I was going to see my video 
production manager, Jorge Santa Maria. And when I was going to New Jersey to visit him, he was on the phone with a gentleman who had just come to the Lord. And it just so happened that we went and picked up this gentleman a cup of coffee and we went to his house to encourage him. I thought I was just on my way to do another transaction to get the introduction to this show started. But it turned out that God had other plans. God planned that I would meet him, that his wife would come to the Lord, that his brother who feels called into ministry and has been walking with the Lord for 13 years would stop by and we'd be able to encourage him to press into God, to seek God to see what God wants to do in his life and to leave three people that were discouraged to living in despair and just being able to minister to them and bring good news and bring the hope of Jesus Christ and bring some practical application. They were living with a lot of anxiety. I was able to share Philippians 4, 6, and 7 with Angel today. I was able to express to him how God tells us to be anxious for nothing but in everything through prayer and supplication with thanksgiving to let our requests be made known to God and the peace of God which surpasses all understanding would guard our hearts and our minds in Christ Jesus. He really understood and took to that and I was able to share 1 Peter 5, 7 where it says that we cast our cares on him because he cares for us. I was able to show him that God wants an intimate relationship with us and it was really able to minister to him and he was looked like he was welled up with tears. He was full of gratitude and hope, the lights of hope and encouragement went off in his eyes. So that's how God uses my business to minister to other people on a day-to-day -day life as well as he allows me to pray with clients that call me for the first time and I'll pray with them and I'll ask the Holy Spirit to enter us and give us vision and give us peace if we're the right company to work for each other. I also make sure that if I'm going to work with them, I vet them and I make sure that their company is one that's not doing anything that's not biblical, that doesn't stand firm on the word of God. And I also talk to them and encourage them to use their business to speak of their faith, to be intentional with what they're doing, how they're doing it and why they're doing it. And I also love to teach people that the product and service that we provide for other businesses really speaks volumes when we go above and beyond. So we should be, as Christian business owners, that person who under promises yet over delivers and has a very affordable fee. Preaching and teaching the word of God without the pulpit. This is the perfect platform for me. I'm a guy who loves the context of the word, but I love application. I wanna know what that looks like in everyday life. So our aim is going to be to teach through scripture verse by verse, extract the application from those spiritual principles and biblical scriptures and show you what that looks like. Keeping in accordance with Hebrews 4.12, this show is going to move forth with teaching the Word of God book by book, chapter by chapter, verse by verse, introducing applications, what that looks like in people's lives, how you can go about and share your faith in everything we do. I'm going to bring forth testimonies of countless business owners and ministers and not-for-profit organizations and ministries have been intentional about their faith and how that has changed many, many others. Today, I wanna to give you my testimony. I wanna tell you about what it was like, what happened, and what it's like now. Jesus Christ has radically changed my life. I was born at a very early age. Seriously, I was born on my brother Joey's ninth birthday and I was three months premature. From that time until the time I was nine years old, I don't remember anything. But what I do remember is my first drink and my first drug and I was nine years old. It was his 18th birthday and I was nine and I was stealing beers from the keg and I was smoking marijuana. That night I was out of control. I wound up being the life of the party because I was a young kid and everybody thought I was funny. And at the end of the night, I was puking and I was making fun of my parents and everybody was laughing at me and they were no longer laughing with me. 
But what I do remember about that night is when I woke up the next day, I felt guilty, I felt shame, I felt remorse, but I also felt like for the first time in my life, I fit in. I don't know if anybody can relate with me, but I didn't feel like I fit in anywhere. I grew up in a house that was riddled with violence, alcohol, drugs, and crime. My whole life I was told to keep my mouth shut when the cops got me and to get rid of the gun so there's no evidence. God has radically changed all of that. So by the ripe old age of 13 years old, I was a full-blown alcoholic and drug addict. I was smoking marijuana daily. I was taking mescaline and acid for those who, you who remember. I was sniffing cocaine at 11 to 13. Anyway, at the age of 13, I wound up in my first Alcoholics Anonymous meeting. When I went to Alcoholics Anonymous, I remember raising my hand in the back of the room and, I, and when they called on me, I said, I don't know what's wrong, but something isn't right. And everyone clapped for me. And when they clapped for me, they all came up to me after the meeting and told me, you're powerless over alcohol, your life is unmanageable, that I need to get a coffee commitment, that I need to join the group, I need to find a higher power, and that I need to get plugged into Alcoholics Anonymous. Well, I didn't believe I was powerless over anything. I had three older brothers, and if I beeped them in the middle of the night, they would wake up and come down to my rescue. So I didn't believe I was powerless, and I didn't see how it related to me that if I drank one drink, I was gonna drink a thousand. Once too many, a thousand is never enough. I never understood that concept until one day when the tables turned, it hit me. With that being said, I entered Alcoholics Anonymous at 13 years old, and for the next 10 years, I went in and out with that attitude of, you want me to make coffee? Here's five bucks, I'll buy you fly. And that's what I always thought was cool. I always wanted to be a wise guy. I always wanted to put people down so I felt better about myself. And I always wanted to hang out with the girls in the group. They told me stick with the winners, so I wanted to hang out with some girl that had a car. I wasn't driving yet, and I thought that that was the way to go and I always ended up drunk and high again. In fact, I ended up drunk, high, and in a lot of trouble with the law over and over and over again. So much so that I spent a lot of my adult and teen years incarcerated either in the county jail or Rikers Island or upstate. Needless to say, when the federal agents raided our drug marijuana ring, we were shut down and I decided that it was a good thing to go to Albuquerque, New Mexico and bring back marijuana on the train so we could continue to run our drug business. God had other plans for me. I also didn't mention that three months prior to this, I had given my life to Jesus Christ inside of a Lutheran church. And I didn't really know what that meant. I didn't know what I was doing but God's word never returns void and the things that we do for the kingdom of God is always working in our lives. Thank God. So when I got to Albuquerque, New Mexico, I was arranging this drug deal. I got off the plane, I was drunk and high already. I decided that I was gonna go into a neighborhood that was undesirable to try to work out this deal. And what happened was I was robbed for the money that I went down there with. When I was robbed, I was beaten to death. When I arrived at the Albuquerque University Hospital, they told me that I was dead on arrival, that they woke me up, so I believe Jesus woke me up, and then they induced me back into a coma, and when they induced me into a coma, they had to perform four brain surgeries to relieve the swelling and bleeding on my brain, and during that process, they removed one third of my brain, and my vocal cords were severed. And as you can see now, the world told me I'll never speak again. And Jesus told me, you'll never shut up, but you're going to talk about me. And I'm grateful that he did do that. So here I am out of a coma, out of incapacitation. They tell me that the night I woke up was after my entire church was praying and fasting all night for me. I come to on the 40th day of my stay in the Albuquerque University Hospital of New Mexico. My parents are with me and my brother Joey flies home to New York to get me into a hospital. He gets me into Bayshore Hospital, Southside Hospital in Bayshore, Long Island. I go to a brain, traumatic brain 
injury clinic in the hospital and I'm supposed to be there for 30 days. I'm complaining about my entire situation over and over and it just seems like I'm getting worse. Then immediately, my brother points it out to me and then I immediately started to thank God again and I started to change again and I started to get stronger. And within two weeks, they released me from the hospital and they sent me home. I was living with my brother Joey at first, then I moved back to my parents. My brother Joey would pick me up every morning. He would take me to the beach. He was teaching me how to walk in the sand. He would carry me around. He would take me to the gym. I had to walk on a treadmill. It was like 0.05 with an alarm on me with his hand on my back. He would hold my back on my shirt because I wanted to fall over from vertigo. He would take me to the basement of an Alcoholics Anonymous meeting. He would place me up front. The transformation that started to take place was incredible. I was just so broken, I was willing to do whatever was necessary. Everyone kept coming up to, up to me on the break and after the meeting telling me how powerless I was of alcohol. I no longer was that wise guy kid that told them, here's five bucks, you fly, I'll buy. This time, I got the coffee commitment. This time, I came early and I stayed late. I got a sponsor and I got into reading what's known as the Big Book of Alcoholics Anonymous. Going through this process, I went through the 12 steps and it says having had a, a spiritual awakening as the result of these steps, you will carry the message to other people. Well, during that process, I was introduced to a childhood faith that I always had, but that was really never taught to me as a kid. At that stage, I was still in a wheelchair. I was going to meetings. I was starting to walk a little bit and I get a call from the Nassau County Correctional Center. The DA tells me, we have a charge against you and you have to turn yourself in. Now here I am on my two feet, my brother's holding the back of my shirt. I'm able to walk around a little bit. I just celebrated a year in Alcoholics Anonymous and I have to turn myself in. And when I go and do that, the judge releases me on my own recognizance after always having a bail. Nothing short of a miracle. Anyway, they offer me 10 years at arraignment. I go in, I'm praying for the judge, I'm praying for the DA, I'm thanking God for this legal situation. I keep thanking him over and over and over again. During this process, the judge gets removed from my case. I then get a judge that sentenced Bobby Moore, the old drug and alcohol counselor from the Nassau County DART program to his last prison sentence. And he helps me get a program. I was being sentenced to seven and a half years in prison, but the judge gave me three and a half months in the drug alcohol treatment center program where I went upstate and I learned how to walk and talk again. In fact, I came home walking and talking like I am today. That was 18 years ago and it's evident it worked. I jumped right back into Alcoholics Anonymous and I kept pressing on. I kept doing things just like I wanted to do them, but I claimed Jesus as my higher power. I claimed to have his Holy Spirit and to live any way I chose to live. Well, I wouldn't say anyway. I would say I lived as a good moral person that was going to hell. About five years into my rehabilitation process in Alcoholics Anonymous, I linked back up with Bobby Moore and he was serving out of a church. He was going there to open up a drug and alcohol program for inmates coming out of prison for a rehabilitation program. So he invited me to join him. I joined him in church and I joined him in the program. I jumped into church. I was called into ministry. About nine months later, I was engaged. My fiance was pregnant and she had an abortion behind my back because we were out of wedlock and she was pregnant. I quickly stopped going to church. I went back to Alcoholics Anonymous and I did things my way for the next 10 years. I ended up in a business with an ex-business partner. He created a lot of problems. It took me the next 10 and a half years to get out of the financial mess that he made. And I was also running from the pain of my ex-fiance. 10 years into this process, I pay back all the money that was the damage that he created, my ex-partner. And then I end up stealing and I end up going back to prison. Now this time, I'm on the news, I'm going to prison, I'm in trouble, and 
nobody will help me. Everybody couldn't believe that this is what I did. I made such a mess out of my life. I lost everything. House was boarded up. My business was closed. I had kickboxing gyms. I had a tanning beds in the kickboxing gym and they were taken out. I lost everything. I lost thousands upon thousands upon thousands of dollars. I ended up going to prison for three years. And during this three year prison sentence, I ended up treating it like a seminary. God met me where I was at. I believed in Jesus Christ. I rededicated my life to him and my life started to radically change. For the first time in my life, I was free. And ironic, I was free on the inside. I was confined in all ways, but yet I was free on the inside. I started to study the Bible. I started to pray, pray and fast. I started to do the things that were necessary for me to do to build a relationship with God. I realized that I needed to spend as much time with God as I would spend with a girlfriend that I wanted to get to know. I wanted to get to know who God was, what his nature was, and what he was like. So I started to read his word. I started to do things that was required of me to do. And I started to feel his presence in my life. Now it's ironic, I'm doing things that's required for me to do but they weren't required for me to do to receive salvation. I received salvation upon believing on Jesus. That is a free gift of God. Salvation is when I move out of death and I move into eternal life. I received salvation the moment I believed on Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior. But what I did do is I started aligning myself according to His holiness. I wanted to emulate the nature of God. And when I started doing that, I was free no matter what my circumstances were. His peace was surpassing all of my situations, the condition I was living in, and I had peace in Christ Jesus. One day when John Randall was teaching, the Spirit of God just captivated me and told me to write him. And then I listened to the next speaker, Lloyd Pulley, who actually runs this radio station and is the pastor of the church in Calvary Chapel, Old Bridge. And I reached out to both of them and Lloyd Pulley wrote me back. And we became friends over the next two years in my life. And he directed me to another Calvary Chapel when I was released from jail. And it was ironic because when I got released from jail, I had nowhere to go. I was sleeping on my brother's floor. Everybody was upset with me. Nobody trusted me. I had problems in my family, problems with everything. I had no money. I had nowhere to go. And I was selling off any old computer equipment that I had left from before I was arrested. I ended up in Calvary Chapel in Amityville, and I ended up in ministry, in leadership there in the church, and I continued to seek God. God was showing me wonderful and miraculous things, the things that I did not know, the things that he promised to answer me and show me if I would call out to him. I continued to call out to him. I didn't do this perfect. I don't want to sound like I became a saint because I'm definitely not a saint. I'm a sinner saved by grace. I'm a sinner that goes to the foot of the cross every single day and calls on the name of Jesus, the name of my Lord and Savior, for strength, for encouragement, for direction, for everything in my life. As I'm going to Calvary Chapel in Amityville, I'm looking for an apartment. Calvary Chapel helps me rent a room in a boarding house. They helped me get a car insurance on an old car I was able to purchase from Facebook. I was working driving building materials from Nassau County all the way to the Bronx, and I was also the escalator. I had to bring all the building materials upstairs, a truckload full every day. It was beating up my body, and I didn't even have enough money at the end of the week to pay my bills. Pastor Claude from Calvary Chapel in Amityville was taking me out to lunch every day on the church credit card and he was helping me feed myself. I was fasting many times because I couldn't afford food. And he was blessing me and loving me, teaching me the Bible and being my friend. He became a best friend of mine and a mentor. He encouraged me on a daily basis to get my business back up and running, that he felt it was a call on my life to be in the marketplace in ministry. It was something that he pointed out to me a long time ago. I didn't see it and I only saw business as a way to distract me, to create more stress in my life and to always keep me away from the Word of God. My business today, Him First Media Group, was birthed 
in Calvary Chapel in Amityville, and I, I put his name to it, him first, so that way I would keep him first in everything I do. The glory would all be his, and I literally did nothing to market my company. But yet clients started coming in, and he started providing for me through my business, and he allowed me to help church radio stations. He, had, he allowed me to help churches with my business. And the more I reached out to other people, the more I was able to share the gospel with people, the more my business grew and the more he provided for me. Preaching and teaching through the Word of God is what we do. We like to look at context, application, and what it looks like to walk this out in your Christian life. We'd like to thank you for being with us on this show today. We pray you are blessed. Before I go, I want to share with you about a ministry that we support. U-Turn for Christ is a Christian discipleship program helping men and women overcome drugs and alcohol in their lives. They help people have victory and walk in freedom. You can reach us on our website at uturnforchristsc.com. We look forward to hearing from you. I also want to recap my testimony, my personal testimony, one where it was broken, despair, drugs and alcohol, prison, to one of victory that I walk in today. Do I live a perfect life? No, I don't. Do I live a victorious, free life? Yes, I do. You too can walk in victory. I thank you so much once again for being here. Please visit our website and check out our social media. We look forward to sharing the Word of God with you next week.